get that big. But they involve, they could involve yield curve relationships or, or on the run, off the run governments or things like that that are just things you learn over time if you're around securities markets. They're not the base of our business. Probably on average, they've accounted for a half a percentage point of our return a year, or, you know, or three quarters of a percentage point a year of our return. They're little pluses that you get for for actually having just been around a long time and learning a little bit about it. First arbitrage, not the first arbitrage I did, but one of the first arbitrages I did involved a company where you they were offering cocoa beans in exchange for their stock. That was in 1955. And I bought the stock, turned in the stock, got warehouse certificates for cocoa beans, and, and they happened to be a different type. They were trading the Aircoke Exchange, but there was a basis differential in my favor, and I sold them. I mean, that's just something that I was around at the time, so I learned about. It. Hasn't been a cocoa bean deal since. You know? <laughs> Forty odd years. I've been waiting for another cocoa bean deal. I haven't seen it, but, but it's, it's there in my memory if it ever comes along. <laughs> And that uh, long-term capital is that on a big scale. Yep. The question is about diversification, and I've got a dual answer to that. If you are not a professional investor, if, you're, if your goal is not to manage money in such a way as to get a significantly better return than the world, uh, then I believe in extreme diversification. I mean, if it... So I believe 98 or 99 percent, maybe more than 99 percent of people who invest uh, should extensively diversify and not trade. So in, that leads them to an index fund type of uh, decision with very low cost. Because all they're going to do is own a part of America. And they made a decision that owning part of America is worthwhile. I don't quarrel with that at all. That is the way they should approach it unless they want to bring an intensity to the game to make a decision and start evaluating businesses. But once you're in the business of evaluating businesses, and, and you decide that you're going to bring the effort and intensity and, uh, uh, and time involved to get that job done, then I think that diversification is a terrible mistake in, in, to any degree. And uh, I got asked that question when I was at SunTrust the other day. And uh, if you really know businesses, you probably shouldn't own more than six of them. I mean, if you can identify six wonderful businesses, that is all the diversification you need. And you're going to make a lot of money. And I will guarantee you that going into a seventh one, is going to, rather than putting more money in your first one, it's got to be a terrible mistake. Very few people have gotten rich on their seventh best idea. No, but a lot of people have gotten rich on their best idea. Yeah. So I, I, would, uh, I would say that for anybody working with normal capital who really knows the businesses they've gone into, a six is plenty. And, uh, and I probably have half of it in what I liked best. I don't diversify, personally. I mean, and... and uh, uh, all the people I know that have done well, uh, with the exception of, well, we mentioned Walter Schloss here earlier. Walter diversifies a lot. He owns a little of everything. I call him Noah. You know, he's got two of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Procter and Gamble is a good, a very, very good business. Strong distribution capability, lots of brand names and everything. But if you ask me, we're going to go away for 20 years to put all my family's net worth in one business. But I'd rather have Procter & Gamble or Coke. Actually, Procter & Gamble would be more diversified among product line, but I would feel sure of Coke than Procter & Gamble. I wouldn't be unhappy if somebody told me I had to own Procter & Gamble during that 20-year period. I mean, that would be in my top 5% because they, they are not going to get killed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but I would feel better about the unit growth and the pricing power of a Coke over 20 or 30 years than I would about a Procter & Gamble. Right now, the pricing power might be tough, but you think of a billion, billion servings a day, you know, an extra penny, $10 million a day, you know. We own 8% of it. That's, that's $800,000 a day for Berkshire Hathaway. <laughs> you get another penny out of the stuff. <laughs> doesn't seem impossible, does it? I mean, it, it's worth another penny. But, uh, it doesn't, right now, it'd be a mistake to try and get it in most markets, but over time, Coke will make more per serving than it does now. 20 years from now, I'll guarantee it'll make more per serving. They'll be selling a whole lot more servings. I don't know how many. I don't know how much more, but I know that. Uh, P&G's main products, I don't think they have the kind of dominance, and they don't have the kind of unit growth, but they're, but they're good businesses. You know, I, I would not be unhappy uh, if you told me that I had to put my family's net worth in P&G, and that was the only stock I could own. I would, you know, there w I might prefer some other names, but there aren't a hundred other names I would prefer. Yep. 
McDonald's, the question is about McDonald's and going away for 20 years. McDonald's has got a lot of things going for it, and particularly abroad again. I mean, their, their position in abroad in many countries is stronger relatively than here. It's a tougher business over time. People do not want to eat, um, exception to the kids when they're giving away beanie babies or something, people do not want to eat at McDonald's every day. I mean, uh, if people are drinking Coke today, they drink five of them today, they'll probably drink five tomorrow. Uh, the the fast food business is tougher than that. At, uh, but if you had to pick one hand to have in the fast food business, which is going to be a huge business worldwide, you'd pick McDonald's. I mean, it has the, the strongest position. Uh, it doesn't win taste tests, you know, with adults. It, I mean, it does very well with children, and it does fine with adults. But it does, I mean, it is not. A, it is not like it's a clear winner. At, 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 and uh, and it's gotten into the game in recent years of being more price promotional and and uh, you know you remember the experiment a year ago or so and uh, so it's gotten more dependent on that rather than just selling the product by itself. I like a product by itself sells. I, I feel better about Gillette if, if people buy the Mach Three because they like the Mach Three than if they get a Beanie Baby with it. You know, I mean, uh, uh, and so I, I just think it's fundamentally a stronger product if that's the case and. And uh, you know it probably is. We own we own a lot of Gillette, and and you, you can sleep pretty well at night if you think of a couple billion men with their hair growing on their faces. You go to you know they're, it's growing all night while you sleep. You know, and, <laughs> and women have two legs. <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> so it's uh, it beats county sheep. I, <laughs> and those are the kind of business. But if you think you know what promotion am I going to put out there against Burger King? Next month, you know, and what if they sign up Disney and I don't get Disney? And I mean, that, that is, I, I, I like the I like the products that stand alone, ab, uh, absent promotional or price appeals. Although you can build a very good business based on that, and, and McDonald's is a terrific business. It's not as good a business as as Coke, but that they're, they're, you know there really are hard, hardly any. Uh, it's a very good business, and if you bet on one company in that field, aside from Dairy Queen, of course, you might bet on McDonald's. We bought Dairy Queen here a while back. That's why I'm plugging it. Shamelessly here. <laughs> yeah, way back there. What do I think of what? The electric utility industry. Well, I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot because you can put big money in it. And and I've even thought of buying the entire businesses. There's a fellow in Omaha, actually, that's, that's, that's done a little of that uh, uh, through Cal Energy. But I don't quite understand the game in terms of how it's going to develop. Uh, uh, with deregulation, I mean, it's it. There's got I can see how it destroys a lot of value uh, for the high cost producer. You know, once they're not protected by a monopoly territory, and I don't for sure see how who benefits and how much. I mean, obviously, the guy with very low cost power, some guy's got hydropower, you know, at two cents a kilowatt or something like that, has got a huge advantage. But how much of that he's going to get to keep and everything, or how extensively he can. He can send that outside his natural territory. I haven't been able to figure that out with a, so that I really think I know what the industry is going to look like in 10 years. But it is something I think about, and if I ever develop any insights, you know, that call for action, I'll develop, you know, I, I will act on it. But it, because I think I can understand the attractiveness of the product and it's, it's all of that, all of the aspects of certainty of, of user need and, and, and the fact that it's a bargain and all of that. I understand. I just don't understand who's going to make the money in it uh, 10 years from now, and, and that keeps me away.